Hello, my name is Adam Jackson and uh, we're here in the centre of the city of Norwich at St Stephen's Church. We're here with a current serving city councillor and also a prospective MP for Mid Norfolk for the Green Party. Simeon Jackson, welcome. Hello. It's uh, good to see you here uh, as one of the reigning councillors of this city and, and also making the big step to possibly becoming one of the uh, many Green Party candidates standing in different regions around the country. Uh, what we've done is uh, we've asked various people on social media to, to, to send in their questions so that um, I can ask you and challenge you on these different things. So mm -hmm. we'll, uh, it'll be interesting to see what the people say. Okay, so, um, so do you really think that the Green Party uh, are going to stand much of a chance in this election? Are they going to have enough seats to, um, to make a difference? Bear in mind that the predictions say that possibly only uh, retaining the, the single seat they've got at the minute will happen. And if so, is it really worth voting for them? Even with just one MP, we have already made quite a big difference to the lives of many people. Caroline Lucas has done so much work in the last parliament. Um, She's put through some very important bills uh, and um, motions. She's been challenging TTIP, uh, an international trade deal. She's been um, standing up for the NHS, uh, challenging the government in some of the areas where, uh, where Labour haven't really been uh, doing so. Uh, so even just Caroline Lucas getting back in, in, into Parliament is really worth it for all the people who are voting Green. And what we really need is some more people to join her and really strengthen that voice, a voice which isn't really being heard at the moment. So, uh, uh, so yes, voting Green makes an absolutely big difference. Do you think that the, the name and the colour and everything, which is, is very specific to one party policy, how much do you think that influences the electorates? Uh, do you think that pushes too much of an emphasis on just the environment? This is, this is a really interesting question. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that when it first started, the Green Party was called the Ecology Party. So uh, it was even more a, a one issue um, kind of view uh, that we were putting across, it was all about ecology and it's been scaled back to just green because actually that's, that it is a much broader uh, range of policies, range of um, views. But it's important to recognise that actually that's, it's very important that we are called the Green Party because we stand up for green politics which is, uh, which acknowledges that we have a huge problem. Um, with, uh, with trashing the planet and using resources at too fast a rate, uh, and that, uh, that we're the only party to recognise that that's, it's not just one issue, it's interlinked with the whole way we run our economy, the way we do politics, um, and all of these things link together. You know, when we're building housing, we want them to be uh, to the highest possible energy efficiency standards because that is, uh, that is, has a knock-on effect on energy bills and energy use and carbon reduction. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. No spoilers so far. <laughs> okay. Um, so, lots of people are talking about uh, all the predictions and the polls are saying there's going to be a hung parliament this year. Mm -hmm. So, little parties, especially the SNP, who possibly aren't that much of a little party anymore, and uh, UKIP and the Greens will be the kingmakers. So, um, yeah, one of the questions someone had was, which with the Green Party do you think, although I don't suppose too much of that is down to you, this uh, is, would they be prepared to make deals with, uh, with Labour? And, um, yeah, and what sort of things would be the priorities and the negotiations? Yeah. Well, uh, as you say, exactly what the deals would end up being, we cannot say it completely depends on, uh, on what the political makeup is after the election. But um, we did discuss this at, at our spring conference, and a motion came which, uh, which basically committed ourselves not to make uh, any deal with the Conservatives to get the Conservatives back into power. Um, and also, 
that we would not form a coalition with, uh, with any party unless we were the majority of that coalition. But what that does mean is that, is that the, the one uh, option that we've left open is the possibility of striking a deal um, for uh, confidence and supply, which means that, uh, that for no confidence votes, we would vote um, for a Labour uh, administration. But for every single other issue, we would vote on that particular issue. And we would only do that if there were some concessions that meant that, uh, that we wanted to strike that deal. Interesting. Okay, okay, because um, yeah, the political wrangling is, a, is what a lot of people find difficult for, for new parties that have any experience to mm -hmm. um, come into the House and then start uh, finding that all their visions and dreams can't come true because actually political capital is a very difficult thing to come by. Yeah, indeed. And the, when you go into coalition, because you have to make a, a decision at the beginning that you're going to vote with the government on it, basically every single issue, um, and have to arrange at that point what your uh, what your deal is going to be. Uh, that means that it's very tight, uh, and you, you from that point onwards got no real control over what you're going to be uh, voting for and against. Mm. We're back here with Simeon Jackson. Uh, candidate for the Green Party for Mid Norfolk and also a councillor in the city of Norwich here at St Stephen's Church. Uh, the Green Party have released their manifesto yesterday. One of our viewers wrote in and said, uh, do, uh, is there still uh, the proposal to, um, yeah, to put the Queen in a council house? Is that still the plan? Um, no, is the short answer. This refers to a, a joke that Natalie Bennett made in an interview. Um, she, uh, she was asked a question on our policy for uh, constitutional reform and that hereditary principles should not have a place in politics. Uh, that, is, that is our policy. We would set up a people's con con constitutional convention um, to let the people decide how the country should be governed uh, and what part the uh, monarchy plays in that. Um, Interesting. We, yeah. we don't believe that the monarchy should be an office of government. That doesn't mean it should be necessarily ab abolished altogether, um, but that it shouldn't be an office of government uh, because the citizens should be the, uh, the sovereign. The mm. citizens should be the, the sovereign of this state. <coughs> um, so the, the reference to putting the Queen in, in a council house was, was basically a joke saying if, uh, if the people did decide that they were going to um, kick the Queen out of Buckingham Palace, because of the Green Party's policy on housing, she wouldn't, have a, she wouldn't be left without. Uh, very the, kind of you. We, we think that everybody should have a, uh, an opportunity for a place to live uh, a secure and uh, an affordable place to live, and, and the Queen is included with it. <laughs> nice save. The Telegraph wrote an article earlier on this year that said that if you cut the Green Party down the middle like a melon, it's very green on the outside but the deepest red on the inside. Would you agree that that is true? I would say that the, the Green Party is, a, uh, is quite a socialist party. It is. Uh, we, we believe that uh, that people have the right to um, to welfare and social security, uh, which is something which uh, the uh, coalition government is really uh, attacking. Um, that that they're they're trying to reduce the size of the public sector uh, so much that it's actually meaning that some people really can't uh, cope with their lives, and it's one reason why mental health is uh, is is really exploded uh, because there's uh, there's so much pressure um, uh, on social security mm. and, uh, and then they can't get the services they need. So um, in Mid Norfolk, where you stand, it's a very rural community, and actually there's quite a lot of deprivation, isn't there? Which lots of people don't realise being. Um, rural environments you think oh, everyone living in stately homes or being farmers and enjoying the country air mm. uh, what, are you, what are the most important things to mid Norfolk voters uh, well there has been a lot of discussion within mid Norfolk about development 
because there's uh, a lot of uh, proposals for, um, for massive housing estates, basically, mm. on the edges of towns. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, there's basically, there's not the infrastructure um, set up to be able to cope with that expansion. Um, so it's a massive issue in uh, Wyndham and in Deerham um, and uh, Watton and, and Thetford <laughs> as well. I went, to, I went to a hustings that was on this subject uh, and one of the things that I was saying uh, there was that it really should be local people who are uh, in control of planning in their local environment. Interesting because the the Green Party uh, manifesto, one of their sort of one of the things that's really got attention is this idea of building uh, 500,000 uh, affordable homes, mm -hmm. which would be part of that would be to kind of replenish the stock that was sold off in the Thatcher years, and um, that that would then be alongside the the regular construction done by private developers and and private home builders as well. Mm -hmm. 500,000 houses in a single term is a huge amount, so that would equate to 7.8 new cities the size of Norwich being built in just five years. Um, that sounds like the country would end up being grey rather than green. It's, we, we need housing. There, it's clear that there is a housing shortage nationally uh, and that we need to build up our housing stock. Um, uh, and what's more, because uh, because much of the housing stock that's in existence at the moment is quite uh, it is not very energy efficient. Um, it's much easier to build new housing um, to high energy efficiency standards uh, as well. Um, the the location of of that development um, should really be based on where the demand for that uh, housing is. So now more I'm in not, the south east. Uh, yes, there probably should be more in the southeast. Um, but basically, we have to look at the uh, we have to look at the demand in a particular area, and where there are lots of jobs and uh, and people are struggling to find um, find homes. Uh, we need an expansion of homes, and where there's uh, rural areas that are basically kind of at capacity and have all the housing that they need and are actually tending to um, not have enough jobs to, uh, to support mm. expansion. That's probably an inappropriate place for um, development. Now, I'm, I'm not actually aware of the uh, of a Green Party policy on this exactly, so what I'm saying is what <laughs> kind of yeah. I think should be the policy and, and because I'm involved in the re review of our um, planning policy uh, as a party, um, I know we'll be proposing this as one of the things okay. that goes into it. But um, the, basically, we need a national, um, a national strategy for dealing with nationally significant uh, targets and uh, and infrastructure. So, for things uh, for things which are nationally important, like our energy, like um, the total amount of housing stock. Mm. We need a, a strategy where communities can, uh, or whole regions can get together and say where they think that the, the expansion can be sustainably um, and where they think the, uh, the kind of transport infrastructure needs to be to make sure that that's supported. Because that's one of the things about Mid Norfolk is that uh, at the moment it's not very well served, particularly by public transport, Good train hand. services. Yeah. Famously then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, so um, it seems pointless creating new, um, new, whole new areas of uh, Mid Norfolk when, um, when actually there are much better places served by uh, rail services mm -hmm. uh, which could expand in a much more sustainable way. Okay, so um, so you say so that there is there is a big housing demand at the minute, isn't there? I think that's everyone has seen that. Especially if you try and buy a house as a young person, I think the the average age now for buying your first house is 32. Um, so I, uh, every year the population in the UK goes up by. Well, last year it was 300,000, over 300,000, which is uh, a city nearly twice the size of Norwich every year just because of, uh, that, that's just through net migration. So let's assume that's um, 
everyone entering the country comes in legally and registered, which they don't. Uh, and there's no new, uh, there's not more births than there are deaths in the UK. And uh, that's, yeah, there's no other factor. Let's say there's no backlog, nothing. We still would need to build uh, a city and a half the size of Norwich every year just to keep up with net migration. Mm. So, um, so you talk about sustainability and house building. After you build these 500,000 houses and the population is still going up by a city and a half the size of Norwich every year, and uh, the party policy, I believe, is in um, proposes uh, reducing uh, border controls, so naturally net migration would go up. That doesn't sound very sustainable. The uh, it's a really difficult question. Um, the the uh, demand uh, on uh, housing uh, is big in this country. Um, we do need uh, some expansion, but that's uh, there are areas uh, where there are brownfield sites which are not being brought back into use, and it. it it's largely down to uh, economics and profits mm. of, of uh, development companies. Um, and the reason why there's so much development on greenfield site at the moment is because it's cheap and easy for developers to do. And uh, what we really need is a way that um, uh, is, is a way of making sure that it is uh, the most sustainable locations that are brought forward for development, even if that doesn't, even if it is actually quite costly. Um, I know of um, three or four sites very central to Norwich, which uh, are not being built on and are basically left empty at the moment, despite the fact they could be providing 200 homes each. Um, and the reason is because it would cost too much for the developers to build it as it is. Um, they would have to knock down buildings. And actually, this isn't about not um, not being affordable at all. It's that they don't make enough profit. Yeah, there's not, yeah. I, I understand, yeah, and, okay, that and makes really, sense. They, I, I don't know if you're aware that there's um, proposals being coming forward by the uh, national government, which are saying that all brownfield sites should, all brownfield sites should have um, automatic planning permission for housing. Uh, that's, that's, I feel, is a very dangerous um, uh, approach to take because there are some locations where it is not sustainable and housing is not appropriate on those sites. However, the, uh, and also one of the things about that is just because it's got planning permission on it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. No, um, no, of course not. And, uh, and one of the things that the, um, the uh, select committee for the communities and local government uh, highlighted on this issue um, what was exactly that point um, and that actually what we need is ways to make sure that those developments that have planning permission do actually get built and that could be by actually to some extent subsidising those, um, the house those sites. Okay, and so that, once that, that perhaps you're not allowed, a particular um, developer or owner is not allowed to uh, develop on a, a, an out of town site or there shouldn't be an expansion mm. of a particular uh, area out of town until some certain sites in the. Uh, have been unlocked. Have been, yeah, have been. I uh, see, so we've. Um, there are 600,000 empty properties that potentially could be turned to houses. Some of those are ridiculously expensive to do, possibly because of pollution or whatever, and some are much easier. Mm. Um, still, 600,000 is a finite number after we built this half a million uh, houses in. You know, one, that's 7.5 Norwiches there. The 600,000, we converted all of those. That's another eight or so Norwiches that we built worth of housing. Th that doesn't change the fact that the population is still increasing and the population density is still increasing. Mm. Um, we haven't even begun to talk about um, reliance on external uh, food imports because, of course, when we're building on all these sites, we're reducing down our ability to grow things like biofuels and, and food. It doesn't seem sustainable to say, yes, it's at all costs, this policy of open border immigration must be retained. Mm. Well, it, that's a, to, to many extents a global issue, mm. uh, the issue of population. And uh, there is a trend globally that um, population, is, uh, population growth is slowing. What we need internationally is, uh, is policies that really make the entire world more sustainable. Um, and uh, that's 
uh, that's not really possible with the kind of economic structures and the, uh, the trade uh, deals that we've currently got. Um, uh, hey, the, this, uh, that sounds like a bigger problem than what maybe you as a city councillor or the Green Party as a national party with possibly only one or a dozen seats will be able to do. That sounds like more of a long-term plan that requires the cooperation of making the whole world a yeah. better place. Yeah, it really is. That humans um, don't seem to want to do at the minute. Uh, that people prefer to make money, it seems, and they do to make the world a better place. Yeah, have you heard of a book called uh, This Changes Everything by Naomi Klein? Um, she, she talks a lot in that book uh, about the, the international um, structures that, that are causing uh, this very unsustainable way of living, the, very, the consumerism that we have, that uh, we're buying a lot of our products from uh, abroad, which means that we're not taking any responsibility for the uh, for the environmental impact that they're having in those other countries. Mm. It also means that the shipping of them is uh, is is costing a lot in terms of environmental um, uh, environmental destruction. Mm. Um, uh, and what the Green Party are really calling for is that our economy needs to change so that it's focused around uh, local communities and things that should be things that can be done locally should be done locally so actually there's there should be a much uh, lower need for um, uh, there should be much lower stress on uh, our global system because these uh, all of the function all of the things that are um, be done as local as possible. That are, that are basically just serving mm. an international trade uh, system mm. uh, wouldn't be happening. They'd be unnecessary. And in things like uh, <coughs> expansion of airports and things like that, we, we shouldn't be expanding airports. We should be reducing the need for, uh, for so much air freight and mm. air, um, air travel. Okay, um, so moving on to something that uh, lots of people found really strange was uh, part of the the kind of in our better worlds manifesto that the Green Party have been talking about for a while is is the proposal to decriminalise terrorist membership. That seems a bit strange and dangerous. What's the deal there? Uh, that's not in our manifesto. Um, again, that's that's something. Um, uh, it's something which was uh, mentioned in an interview. Um, Basically, anything which is uh, which promotes or supports or is, is any kind of terrorist act is illegal okay, uh, and should remain illegal. That's, they, we agree on that. Yeah, and, and that includes membership of terrorist organisations. Mm -hmm. But we we have to be careful here that we aren't uh, are basically making uh, free speech and people having their own beliefs uh, illegal, um, and that there should be. That, that we don't cross the line between um, between protecting uh, our country's security mm. and uh, civil liberties, because people should be free to believe what they want uh, and uh, express those things. Um, and it's especially important when you've got um, when you've got people who are uh, scapegoating uh, entire sections of society, entire religions. Um, because um, because a, a minority, a very very small minority of those people who conform to that religion, are um, are doing terrorist acts. So, you, well, you you mentioned religion. Uh, something else someone asked us about was um, so uh, yeah. Was one of the uh, proposals was to really remove lots of the faith influence in schools, so uh, the par party that, uh, that often talks about being uh, supporters of free thinking and, um, that, as you said, uh, and also uh, yeah, looking to young people and promoting this sort of stuff, um, you know, free thinking, any idea goes, it's okay to be who you are, uh, does that not extend to faith? Yeah, it, uh, it does. I'll just read you the part from the manifesto that um, we're that referring to here. Yeah, this is the uh, the 
actual manifesto for this election, by the way. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, we will phase out public funding of schools run by religious organisations. Uh, schools may teach about religions, but should not encourage adherence to any particular religious beliefs. Um, and there's also a further clause um, uh, that we would, uh, we would ensure that all schools that serve particular vulnerable communities, for example Jewish, uh, Muslim or Sikh communities, are adequately protected from sectarian uh, attacks. So this is, it's really, the, our policy is to um, protect the freedom uh, of individuals to make their own choices about uh, uh, about religion, about um, about faith, and to give them, uh, as you say, the freedom um, to uh, to think freely about religion and about uh, about all the issues that affect them. When One, you, yeah, when you say um, when you say the particularly vulnerable communities uh, and faith, they were all faith groups there. Mm. Is that, uh, and from attack, is that philosophical or is that a uh, physically violent attack? You say protecting uh, them from It's a uh, philosoph philosophical attack. The, uh, there are some, th this basically relates to particular uh, examples that have, have come up um, fairly recently um, where there are uh, communities that have very mixed uh, religious views, um, but that uh, because the um, because some very uh, influential uh, kind of governors or parents within those uh, within those schools want it to be uh, want their religion to be um, uh, adhered to throughout the school, uh, that means that the the uh, members of marginalised religions end up being uh, in this uh, in this very difficult position. <laughs> Um, what is your? What would you propose would be the the alternative to first past the post? There. Yeah, the, the electoral reform society has uh, has done a lot of research um, on electoral systems. I don't think that there's ever going to be a absolutely perfect system, um, but uh, but some of the systems that the the Green Party uh, would consider are the single transferable vote system. Uh, and uh, additional member systems. Um, whilst, uh, whilst first past the post or supplementary vote systems are not appropriate. Uh, the uh, yeah, it, it's it's not a uh, uh, electoral firm. Electoral reform is not something that I know. Uh, a lot about, and I couldn't tell you exactly how those systems work. Um, but but um, it's—I uh, I think we are in a difficult position as a nation at the moment because there is still a lot of misunderstanding about even how our the electoral system that we do have works, uh, and um, uh, and that's. Uh, that's meant that when we, we did have an alternative on the table, uh, many people kind of ran away scared from the idea of, of change. Um, and it, I think that the graph that I showed you earlier just shows actually we do need change. Um, and um, and that, that the party political system isn't really working because it ends up with a minority of the population um, being the ones who, who decide who's got most power. Okay, so, um, so, yeah, okay. Uh, I think finally, if we come into land, with, so a lot of, uh, it seems that there's a lot of promises being thrown around in, in this election generally mm. and the Green Party have really gone the extra mile about things like promising to bring, take back from the private sector the NHS and um, to you know, invest lots more in schools, build these half a million houses. Mm. Uh, how is all this going to be paid for? Yeah, that's a question which, which always comes up. Um, 
Now, uh, th there's a much broader um, question related to this, which is uh, what is an appropriate size for the public sector? Um, and in, in some other countries, um, they have a much, much larger public sector than, than we have here. In North um, Korea, for example. <laughs> well, that wasn't the example I was thinking of. But <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking of Denmark and, uh, and Sweden. Uh, okay. Many of the, the kind of Scandinavian countries and some of the European countries. Um, and they really have, uh, they really take public services seriously. And when, when we talk about having a, an NHS that really works for people, that means that we don't continually, um, we aren't continually driving for efficiencies and making sure that, that we get the, um, we're basically overloading uh, the staff um, who, who, I mean, if you currently look at the, the staff who won't work for the NHS, you've got people who are working 12 hour days but only being paid for eight of them mm -hmm. um, because there's this expectation of what they've got to do in a day and it's just too much for that, that person and uh, what we're really calling for is that those people should have, um, have good jobs where they have rights as uh, really strong rights as workers um, and that they can also, also provide really good service um, and, and that, How do we that pay for this? Though? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, sorry. I'll come back. I'll come back to that. Um, so, uh, so there's there's two mechanisms. Mechanisms. One is to actually raise taxation, uh, and uh, the Greens are proposing several forms of taxation. There's a, uh, a Robin Hood tax, uh, or a Tobin tax, financial transaction tax. What is that? Uh, so that's a tax on uh, financial transactions. Um, and will that affect the common person? Uh, largely not, because it's it's really about uh, financial tra transactions between banks and between large corporations and banks, um, uh, and taking a, a very small percentage actually of each each transaction, um, but uh, over a large number of transactions that actually raises quite a large amount of money. Mm. Um, I haven't got the, the page from the manifesto, uh, but we have actually set out uh, um, how much we would expect to raise from each of these taxes. Mm. Um, there's also a wealth tax, so those who uh, are worth more than uh, three million pounds um, would have to give a proportion of their uh, wealth. And that one's interesting because that's, you're taking money that people have already been taxed on, uh, maybe they inherited it and were taxed on it. So what we could have a situation here is where someone worked their whole life, paid tax, then left that money to their children who also pay tax on, on, on again, and then if that amount is over three million, they're then paying, taxing it a third time. That sounds like a concoction for revolution to me. I, I think when you look at the, um, the people who fit into these categories, they largely have wealth, not from their own efforts, but actually from the efforts of society. Um, they have employees who have been educated within, the, uh, within our education system. They have... Uh, they, um, uh, their companies, the things that they own, are using uh, public services and public uh, transport transportation um, networks that require funding. So that wealth has really come from uh, society in the first place. They don't, they're not there in isolation. If someone was on a desert island, if, if one of these people were on a desert island, they wouldn't be a millionaire because there's, there's nowhere that they could get that wealth from. So actually, uh, they, they are in that privileged position and we feel as though they should, uh, they should contribute um, because they are in that privileged position. Okay, uh, uh, what much are the taxes? Of the time, uh, much of the time, these are the same people who are, who are avoiding things like inheritance tax mm. and, um, and uh, corporation tax through schemes that, um, that really need, uh, that need uh, sorting out these loopholes in our tax system uh, that allow people who are earning millions of pounds a year being taxed 
by percentage less than some people who are earning uh, 20 or 30 thousand pounds. Okay, are there any other taxes that, um, any other big movements in fundraising that's, uh, that we should know about? Well, I'd say, I'd say the biggest is uh, closing down uh, tax loopholes. Um, the, the, uh, the government estimates, uh, well, there, there are estimates uh, of how much tax we're losing um, from tax evasion and tax avoidance, and uh, they are massive amounts of money. And it, I think it's irresponsible of the government to be cutting the number of uh, staff in HMRC who are supposed to be recovering uh, some of that tax. Um, uh, whilst there's such a huge shortfall, mm. we should be increasing the amount of, um, of staff we've got in HMRC uh, recovering that money. Um, because it, it, if we've got tax system, we should be collecting the tax on it. So with all this, it seems like the Green Party are really going to town on, on the richer in society. Really, yeah, so there's a 60% tax uh, for people earning over 150000 as well. Um, hiking at the inheritance tax, closing loopholes, um, attacking the financial sector. Don't you feel like these people are the job creators, are the entrepreneurs? Uh, are we going to end up with lots of those people moving abroad and losing what we have as uh, the powerhouse of the UK? I think there's uh, there's a misconception about what uh, about how our economy works from that point of view. Um, when when you're talking about corporations um, deciding to move abroad, um, I mean if you, if you look at something like Amazon, who famously been mm. avoiding very large amounts of tax um, by basing themselves in in foreign countries, uh, and the question you have to ask yourself is. Uh, would people suddenly, suddenly stop buying books if Amazon left the UK? No, they would just buy them from uh, a different company that are paying their taxes and uh, are contributing to uh, public infrastructure. And the same goes of many of the richest people. If they really want to move, out, move abroad, then, um, then that's fine, because they're the ones who are actually sucking out of our economy um, rather than contributing to it. And what we really want here is people who are contributing to our society. And I think that there are going to be many people who actually uh, who do fit into that, those higher um, tax uh, brackets who are actually very willing to stay in Britain because Britain has great things. We have... Uh, there, there are communities which they've been a part of for years and years, which uh, where, where all their friends are living, and that they've uh, built up relationships with not just personal relationships, but with schools and the institutions in their local area. Um, they're, they're not going to give that up lightly um, to to move abroad just for tax reasons. Mm. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming today. Um, it's been really enlightening and, uh, and I hope we've all learnt something more about what the Green Party, this snappy little new party that's come onto the scene and uh, seems to be taking the place by storm. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see what happens in May during the election and uh, I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you. Thank you.